Hey, Wave Nunley here again with Bible Unplugged, and today we're going to be diving off into the subject of Hanukkah. We're going to be looking at its background and its importance to us as Bible believers. So why discuss a Hanukkah at this particular point in time? Well, it's somewhere between the end of November to the middle of December that the festival of Hanukkah typically occurs. According to the most ancient documents that we have, 1 Maccabees goes back to about 134-135 BC. Uh, I've got the text there because some of you like to do your homework and you like to go back and check these passages and read them for yourself. All of this stuff is available on the internet at earlyjewishwritings.com. I've given you the exact references here. This day is supposed to fall on the, in the Jewish month of Kislev and on the 25th day of that month. Well, Judaism has uh, goes by a lunar calendar. Most of the rest of the world goes by a solar-based or a solar-driven calendar. So a lunar-based calendar is going to give you a 360 354-day uh, calendar as opposed to the solar, which is 365 point something or other. This means that uh, the months are going to be a little bit different, and in some years, Judaism even has to add a 13th month, Adar Hasheni, or the second Adar. And so this is what causes the fluctuation between sometimes Hanukkah occurring the last week or so of November all the way into the middle of December. By the way, it's also the reason why some years Passover and Easter almost perfectly coincide, and on other years, they're going to be as far as a month off. So this year, Hanukkah is going to take place on December the 10th. It will begin at sundown that night because from Genesis 1, all the way to today, the uh, way that Judaism marks time is from evening to evening, not from 12 o'clock until 12 o'clock or from sun up to sundown or whatever. It's from sundown until sundown. As the book of Genesis says, and there was evening and there was morning one day. So you have Jewish time being marked from Genesis 1 onward, from sundown to sundown. So on sundown, December the 10th, you, you can begin to celebrate the eight days of the Feast of Hanukkah. So why a Bible study on the subject of Hanukkah? It's a non-biblical holiday, and yet at the same time, uh, it is still celebrated in Judaism today, and I would argue that Christians have a, a, a almost as much of a reason to celebrate as well, and we'll get into that in our study today. For example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, we hear about an event in the life and ministry of Jesus. It says, at that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place at Jerusalem the Feast of the Dedication. The root, the three-letter root on which the word Chanukah is based is the root Chanak, the ch sound, the N and the K, Chet Nun Kuf in Hebrew. And this word means to dedicate or to rededicate. So when Jesus is at the Feast of the Dedication, he is observing nothing less than Hanukkah. So this most important figure in uh, early Christianity, Jesus himself, makes a special trip to Jerusalem in winter when it's not typically the time of lengthy travel in order to celebrate where it happened, when it happened. So at that time, the Feast of the Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter time, this time of year, a time when typically it's in the middle of the rainy season and kings don't go out to war and people don't typically travel. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple, the book of John is very specific, in the portico of Solomon, a specific area in the temple. The Jews therefore gathered around him and they said, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, the Redeemer, the Rescuer, the Deliverer, if you are the Christ, then tell us plainly. I think that there's a direct connection between these two because in the books of First and Second Maccabees, the Hasmonean house or the Maccabean family are designated as the Redeemers that God rose up 
to deliver the people of Israel from those who would uh, oppress them. Here's a picture of the, uh, a temple model, a city model in Jerusalem. We use it uh, quite extensively when we're teaching there, and it's quite accurate based on the literature and on the archaeology of the time. So this uh, picture has the, the temple in the foreground. Uh, you can see the larger court, which is the court of the Gentiles, the royal stoa, or the beta chanuyot, as it's called in rabbinic sources, where the buying and selling and money changing took place. Uh, you have uh, also the, the highest part, which is surrounded by golden spikes. That would cover the Holy of Holies. And then you have the retaining wall that was built um, largely by King Herod the Great, and his successors, uh, and part of that retaining wall was this area here that had older looking stones from the time of the Maccabees or Hasmoneans, and it was thought by the people of Jesus' day that these dated all the way back to King Solomon. And so Jesus is walking in this covered courtyard with the colonnades there that's come, sometimes called the porch or the colonnade uh, of Solomon. So. Uh, here it says in the Gospel of Matthew, quoting the, the prophecy of Micah, uh, another reason, yet another reason why we as Christians should be connected to this um, world of Hanukkah. This prophecy uh, applied to the life of Jesus by Matthew, Micah says, but you, Bethlehem Ephrata, to little to be among the clans of Judah, Bethlehem, Judah, from you will go forth uh, for me, one who would be a ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, even from the days of eternity. There's another passage in the Gospel of John that sort of adds on to this. Hasn't the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? And there's your connection to Bethlehem. David of the, the son of Jesse from Bethlehem. So if uh, the uh, Jewish people had not survived this scourge of Greek rule and this official um, persecution, an attempt to create, to set up the first one world government that would wipe away Jewish distinctives, if that had been successful, there would have been no Joseph and Mary, no Joseph of the line of David, no Mary of the line of uh, royalty and priesthood for Jesus to have been born, no uh, Jewish uh, city called Nazareth that would have existed on into the first century for Jesus to grow up in. No Judaism for Jesus to have fulfilled its prophecies, to have lived and taught among uh, its people, for Jesus himself and all of the earliest uh, disciples, including the 12 apostles, all being Jewish. That would not have existed, and we wouldn't be uh, standing here having this conversation together. So is this uh, a, an important observance for those of us on the Christian side of uh, faith in God? Absolutely. Now, so let's just go directly to some background for the festival of Hanukkah. The, again, the earliest texts that we have, and most of you, if you followed the, uh, these uh, teachings for any length of time, you know that we dial in not on speculation and conjecture and popular opinion and what's hot and what's not in Christianity, but we focus on what we can not only know but prove. And we are typically dialing into ancient texts. So we go as, push it as far back as we can, and we go to the book of First Maccabees. Again, 134, 135 BC. First Maccabees chapter one tells us that the Greeks defiled the temple. So there goes temple. That's a major component of Judaism and its sacrificial system and the sacredness of its altar. They defile the temple. They profane the Sabbath, another major component of Jewish observance and relationship with God. He direct, the king directed them to leave their sons uncircumcised. There goes another Jewish distinctive. So uh, temple, uh, Sabbath, uncirc and circumcision. 
And the, the decree was, whoever does not obey the king's commands shall die. So death penalty for failure to observe, for failure to reject the major components of Judaism. If anyone adhered to the decrees of the Torah, the decree of the king condemned him to death. So no obedience to the scriptures. They put to death the women who had their children circumcised and their families and those who circumcised them. And they hung the infants from their mother's neck. A gruesome picture indeed. And yet, that first century Jewish historian who lived, grew up in the land of Israel, Josephus, tells us, and again, we have the text here because we want you following along um, in your own copies of these materials. Again, you can get this at earlyjewishwritings.com. Josephus tells us that they were whipped with rods and their bodies torn to pieces. They were crucified while they were still alive and breathed. And by all accounts, as best as I've been able to find, this is the earliest reference to crucifixion introduced during the Greek persecution of Jews with an attempt to obscure or to drive out all Jewish distinctives to obliterate the Jewish faith from the face of the earth in order to institute this one world religion uh, that was being promoted uh, by Antiochus IV Epiphanes in the early 160s BC. They also strangled those women and their sons, their babies, whom they had circumcised and they hanged their sons about their necks as they, the mothers, as the mothers were upon the crosses. So they were actually using the bodies of crucified mothers as also as the gallows uh, to hang their own children. Um, an amazingly gruesome uh, display uh, by any, st any standard and all with the attempt to suppress, to wipe out Jewish distinctives from the face of the earth. You continue to hear about these very gruesome martyrdoms in books like 2 Maccabees, not written by the same author, not even written in the same language or at the same time, but 2 Maccabees, chapters 6 and 7, as well as 14. Again, we're providing this information so you can follow along in the original sources yourself as your interest and time allow. Um, let's talk now about the Hasmonean or the Maccabean revolt. Hashmon is the name of the clan. Judah, his nickname was Hamakabi, means Judah the hammer, um, the Maccabean revolt. So in 1 Maccabees chapters 2 through 9, we hear again the earliest account of this rebellion against Greek rule. In 1 Maccabees chapter 4, we read, Judah chose blameless priests. By the way, blameless priests that reminds you of Elizabeth and Zechariah, the priest who was walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless, according to Luke chapter 1. He chose blameless priests devoted to the Torah, and they cleansed the sanctuary, the temple. They lighted the lamps on the lampstand. We would uh, call that menorah or the menorah. Early in the morning on the 25th day of Kislev, we mentioned this earlier, the, the day that we begin our celebration of Hanukkah. This would be December the 10th, the evening of December the 10th this year. They arose and offered sacrifice on the new altar of burnt offering which they had built because the previous one had been defiled by pagan Greek worship. The text continues. So they celebrated the dedication of the altar for eight days. Therefore, we have an eight-day feast continuing even until today. They offered burnt offerings with gladness. Judas and his brothers and all the assembly of Israel determined that every year at the season of the days of the dedication, notice the dedication, the dedication of the altar should be observed with gladness and joy for eight days, beginning with the, again, 25th day of the month of Kislev. So what does it mean, Hanukkah? or Hanukkah, by the way, makes no difference how you spell it. That's, it's great because you can't be docked points for spelling on this. Hanukkah can be spelled by 15 or 20 different ways. You can 
put a CH at the beginning or just an H. You can double the N's or not double the N's. You can double the K's or not double the K's. You can put an H on the end of the word or not put an H on the end of the word and all the various combinations thereof. It's not an English word, so you don't have to worry about spelling it incorrectly. It's a Hebrew word, this word to dedicate or to rededicate, the word Hanak becoming the root of the word Hanukkah. In the Babylonian Talmud, we get another take on this um, uh, festival of Hanukkah. What is Hanukkah and why are lights kindled on Hanukkah? By the way, that trip that Jesus took to Jerusalem on Hanukkah uh, to celebrate Hanukkah um, happens in John chapter 10. If you dial just back just one chapter before that, Jesus is saying in John chapter 9, I am the light of the world. Is there a connection? I think probably so. I'll leave that to you to do your own homework on, but I believe that Jesus is already playing off of this light theme, Hanukkah. Why are lights kindled on Hanukkah? When the Greeks entered the sanctuary, the temple, they defiled all the oils that were in the sanctuary by touching them. And when the Hasmonean monarchy, the Maccabees, overcame them and emerged victorious over them, did you notice the doublet or, or the poetic parallelism? It's very typical, like foxes have their holes and birds of the air have their nets, or my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the way that Judaism expressed itself from the Hebrew Bible all the way into uh, the New Testament. So they uh, emerged victorious. They searched and found only one cruise of oil. Many of you have already heard this story, but now you're getting to see it for yourself in black and, okay, gray, white and gray. So the, uh, the one cruise of oil that was marked with the seal of the high priest, undisturbed by the Greeks. There was uh, sufficient oil to light the menorah for only one day. A miracle occurred and they lit the menorah from it, from that one cruise of oil for eight days a miracle of multiplication. Are you familiar with that? Oh, absolutely, because Elijah had this miraculous multiplication of, yes, oil in the book of 1 Kings. In addition to that, we get miraculous multiplication uh, with the fishes and loaves when Jesus feeds the 5,000 and the 4,000. So not an unknown quantity, even though it might sound like an outlier. Uh, God is able to supersede the rules or the laws of nature uh, when the situation dictates. Um, you might have uh, also, in relation to this uh, miracle of multiplication, you may have seen pictures like these or objects like this. These are called in Yiddish dreidel, borrowed from the uh, German for top, and the word sevivon, which means something that spins around. Savav means to go around in Hebrew. So the root of this word uh, is to go around. So a top that spins around. Well, you've seen probably the lettering all, uh, on these sevivons or uh, dreidels. And I'd like to just unpack this for just a moment because we're going deeper into the culture so that you are able to better appreciate what's going on there and maybe even implement some of these uh, practices on your own. So reading from right to left, which is the way that you read uh, in Hebrew, um, uh, you have nun, gimel, hey, and pei, four different Hebrew letters. These are all letters of abbreviation or an acrostic. And uh, again, uh, reading from right to left, N, G, H, and P, or Pe. It means or it signifies in Hebrew a great miracle. A miracle great was or happened here. These are the kinds of dreidels that are used in Jerusalem. If you're outside of Jerusalem, you use this kind of dreidel. N, G, H, and then S, H. So, Nun, G, Gimel, He, Sheen. And this acrostic means a miracle, a great, was or happened there in reference to the far-off city of Jerusalem. Now, 
For those who are of um, Pentecostal or charismatic orientation, those who um, believe in a continuation of the miraculous, remember that this is a miracle that takes place between Malachi and Matthew, between Old and New Testaments, and what we call sometimes the interbiblical or probably more properly intertestamental period. It means that God's the same, whether in the days of Elijah or in the days of the Maccabees or in the days of Jesus or today. He's the same all the way through. He's a miracle working God. He's a God who supplies for his people, even when sometimes he has to suspend the normal laws of nature to take care of the needs of those who love him and of all of creation, indeed, if need be. So, dreidel and sevivon. So, some details of a celebration if you're thinking, wow, I might want to get in on this. This is kind of like a, uh, a, a spiritual, a religious July the 4th, uh, a celebration of freedom, a celebration of religious freedom. Absolutely. If you're thinking along those lines, let me give you just a few more ideas. Details of the celebration. Typically, there's uh, the meat for the meal is a brisket. Uh, there is uh, a, a, um, a set of... Um, uh, of potato pancakes called latkes in uh, Yiddish, and that's still the word being used today. And then for dessert, sufganiot. It's just a Hebrew word that means basically donut. And uh, so you've got a full-fledged meal. Here you have the Hanukkah. Uh, I've got an example of that here, of the nine-branched candle stand, as opposed to the seven-branched candle stand of the actual menorah that was in the temple. And uh, there's a festive meal, of course. Um, there's going to be food when there's a celebration, and that's what Hanukkah is, is a major celebration. Um, uh, friends of mine in Israel will say, typically uh, Jewish festivals go uh, along the lines of this. They tried to kill us, we won, hey, let's sit down and eat. I, I get told this over and over when I work in Israel. So uh, enjoy the meal, uh, enjoy the celebration. One of the primary purposes of Hanukkah is inde indeed to celebrate. Uh, to celebrate with special, unique food that will oftentimes lead to questions by kids. Why are we eating this? Why don't we eat this normally? Uh, there are special prayers that are prayed at Hanukkah, only at Hanukkah time. There are games that are played like the sevivon or the dreidel. Uh, there are special songs that are sung, dreidel, 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 I made it out of clay. Uh, that's the Hebrew, uh, or the English. The Hebrew would be, sevivon, sof, sof, sof. Um, it's just a wonderful opportunity to get kids involved and to hand down our faith, um, what we believe, our roots, where we came from, what makes us a unique people, to uh, generations that in some instances aren't even literate yet. Uh, you have all kinds of decorations, um, wonderful foods, uh, opportunity for celebration. Further, uh, the, um, uh, the menorah that is special to Han Hanukkah, so therefore it's called a Hanukkah, has nine branches, actually four on one side, four on the other for the eight days of Hanukkah, and then the one in the middle that is used to light all of the others. That again is in distinction from the normal uh, seven-branched candelabra or menorah that existed in the temple. I've actually put uh, an interesting picture here in the middle. This is from the Arch of Titus in Rome. Titus is the Roman general who oversaw the destruction of the temple uh, and the looting of it. And there you have almost in the middle of the picture the most accurate and most ancient description or depiction of what the menorah looked like um, that, uh, was, that, that sat in the temple in the days of Jesus. This destruction took place in A.D. 70, so this is basically an A.D. 70 video that you're looking at here from the Arch of Titus in Rome. Um, you'll note that many menorahs today are uh, based on this particular uh, version of or look that the uh, menorah takes. So um, here's an, another neat um, uh, expression of Jewish creativity. It's the challah bread that is used in the celebration meal, um, but it's made in the form of a Hanukkah, a nine-branched, uh, 
uh, menorah used at, uh, at Hanukkah, and then also this piece of bread that represents the cruise of oil. I really like the creativity expressed in that. You also read from a script that is already um, put together. It's an ancient script. It's called uh, Megillat Antiochus. And here's an example that you can get on Amazon. And uh, it is in Hebrew, Megillat Antiochus. And you also have it here in English. It says in uh, Hebrew, in English, and in German. Um, and uh, so you can pick your language and you can read through the story of what God did miraculously delivering uh, the few and the, the poorly armed uh, and the poorly trained, delivering them from the, the strong, the many, the mighty, uh, the, the well-trained, the well-financed uh, Greek armies of Mesopotamia. And so uh, as you um, celebrate you might want to make this as visual as possible, especially for the younger uh, among our group. Uh, we talked about the difference between the menorah, the seven-branched, and the Hanukkiah, the nine-branched candle stands. Um, as regards this um, Megillat Antiochus, you might want to use a... Um, a book like this that we picked up some years ago for our grandchildren. And uh, this makes the story very visual. Uh, you can see the, quote, Jewish troops dressed like priests on the left side. On the right side, the well-trained, the well-armed Greek army squaring off uh, in preparation to uh, do battle. The Greeks overpower and control the, the Jewish forces. Uh, over the right to express themselves, uh, relate to God, um, worship God the way that they uh, found to be appropriate, um, and fighting for religious freedom. So let me just take this opportunity to encourage you, whether it's with Hanukkah or it's with the study of the Hebrew language or uh, serious Bible study or whatever, I want to encourage you to connect to your roots um, this thing didn't start yesterday. Uh, in fact, it didn't start the day before yesterday. This stuff goes back thousands of years. And the more closely you can connect to your roots, the more of a sense of belonging, the more of a sense of reality, the more of a sense of understanding who you are and where you come from is going to derive from this um, uh, pursuit of your roots as far back as you want to trace them. It, it, this celebration of Hanukkah is also an opportunity for you to connect to a real historical event. No one questions that these events took place and there is at least a small community among the world population that is still celebrating this incredible victory of God that brought religious freedom. So if you want to jump in on that, if you want to have kind of a July the 4th celebration in the middle of, um, uh, of winter, then jump onto the Hanukkah train and enjoy another opportunity to celebrate. Celebrate the goodness of God. Celebrate the, the power of of God. Give thanks to Him because He's good and He expresses that goodness in acts of deliverance. Um, so this is a wonderful opportunity to do that. You know, I have uh, friends of mine, um, people that I know, that have a really difficult time saying two things. One is, I'm sorry, because if you apologize, then you're giving control and power over uh, to someone else over you that they can, quote, hold over you. Another uh, kind of uh, personality has a really difficult time saying thank you because, yet again, you're acknowledging that you've received something from someone that doesn't derive from yourself, and in that way, you're uh, kind of admitting that they have a certain uh, power uh, to help you in your life. It's this sense of self-reliance that human beings all have, but some people really struggle with this. Let me encourage you to put that part of that fallen personality to death by giving thanks to a God who is worthy of the giving of thanks. Lastly, this is a wonderful way to pass on your faith 
to do it in very visible expressions with food, with decorations, with different prayers, with the telling of the story, but to pass on that faith to a generation that desperately needs reality, that desperately needs a connection to uh, their own roots. Um, And in so doing, we're joining together with a Jewish community that wouldn't even be here if Antiochus, the Greek king, had had his way uh, back in the 160s BC. So would you join with me for just a moment and give thanks to God, give praise to Him, and maybe ask Him how He would want you in the coming days, weeks, and years to pursue your own spiritual roots. Uh, ways that, creative ways that you might be able to commemorate events in which God intervened in your life, in the lives of people in ancient times, and, and how you might be able to more effectively pass on uh, your faith, and especially to those in your own household. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that we are not disconnected from history or from reality or from your past uh, expressions of your power, of your care, of your love in acts of might, acts of deliverance, acts of rescue, delivering the few and the weak from the many and the mighty. We give you praise for that. We thank you that you're still that way today. The same yesterday, today, and forever. You are Yahweh. You do not change. We give you thanks to that. So we ask that as we begin to think along the lines of even more ways to commemorate your incredible work among the human family, that, Lord, you would give us pathways. You'd help us to connect with material online or stuff that we get in the mail, stuff that we order. And we pray that you would help us to be effective uh, in the seeking out of our own roots, but also in the passing on of our faith. As we give thanks to you, help us to bring a multitude along with us, including those, including the young of our own households. Today and in this season of the giving of thanks, the offering of praise of the way that you invade time and space to work with, among, and through your people, we want to thank you, Lord. We want to thank you for your goodness. We give you praise and honor because you're worthy of all of it. Help us as we celebrate as we acknowledge your goodness, as we acknowledge that we are not an end in ourselves. We should not be totally self-reliant, but rely on trust in you and then pass that kind of relationship that we have with you on to generations that are coming um, behind us. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Hey, guys, God bless you richly. Thank you for uh, joining with us in these times of of study. I hope that this will have helped you in your own um, celebration of at least appreciation of what God did in the 160s BC that still resonates today. I pray that this will bring blessing into your life and will bring blessing into the lives of all of the members of your family. God bless you richly this week as you go out and serve Him.